Hey everyone, welcome to Sarah's Cross-Dressing Stories. Today I'm going to share with you Sister's Plan and my beginning part 63. If you're new to the channel then please subscribe now for more captivating stories and, please support me on Patreon and get early access at patreon.com slash sarah101. I squirmed until Gina relaxed her grip and then pushed at her saying, Susan's calling. I have to answer or they'll come in here. Gina backed away, releasing me reluctantly, and I hurried quickly to the door to see what Susan wanted. She was still downstairs. Grandma's on the phone. She wants to speak to you. Coming. I did a quick check of my face and hurried downstairs. Gina followed along behind me. Grandma just wanted to make sure that we would be home for the next few hours since she wanted to drop by and see us. When Grandma arrived, we convened our meeting in the downstairs office. Since it was Saturday, Mary and Judy were home, and they went riding with Gina and Maria while Grandma, Susan, and I held our meeting. As soon as we sat down, Grandma said, I wanted to bring you up to date with the Vermont situation. Things have been moving along quite well. Highland has been fully integrated into our lumber products division now and production has been stepped up tremendously. I asked, do you want us to do an inspection? No, not at this time. I wanted to talk to you about Piermont. What do you want to do about them? Pardon me? I need to know what you want to do about Piermont paper products? You're the company president. The company president? Of course. It was your baby. You gave birth to it. Now you have to care for it. Grandma, I don't know anything about paper manufacturing. Well, neither do I, and I'm a little too old now to start learning. I didn't know anything about lumber, textiles, or cattle ranching when my husband got ill. I had to learn it. But school starts in a couple of weeks. That gives you two weeks to set the company on the right track. I've assembled a temporary, basic management team to organize the company's records and financial situation, but they're all on loan from other divisions. None of them knows the paper business, so it's the duty of the president to chart the company's course. The company plane will be here tomorrow afternoon to pick you up and take you to Vermont. I sat there dumbfounded. It's true that it was my action that brought the company into a Marymore, but I never expected that I would have any further responsibility for it. Grandma, I have to leave for college in a couple of weeks. I didn't have time to learn all about the paper business at that time. Darla and, a good senior-level manager, doesn't have to know every facet of the business. You don't think that the president of General Motors could design a carburetor, do you? You don't think that the president of IBM could repair a computer, do you? And I don't know the first thing about cutting down a tree or recognizing the diseases that infect cotton plants. There are specialists in every organization to handle the details. In a big company, the company president merely charts the course, establishes policy, and supervises the top-level managers. Bob is expecting you on Monday morning. Bob? Bob Warren. He's the one that I assigned as temporary executive vice president. You've met him in the Portland office. Yes, I know Mr. Warren. He's been in Vermont for three weeks now along with a couple of dozen others from various offices. They've been sorting things out and getting everything organized. He can fill you in on Monday. Just let me know if you need anything. Can Susan come with me? Of course. If she wants to. Susan smiled and said, you couldn't keep me away with a team of horses. Well, Grandma said, I'm glad that that's settled. Oh, by the way, the team has identified $237,000 in past due uncollected charges. They were sending out bills, but no one was following up on accounts that didn't pay. They've already collected enough of it to cover the loan arrears. Combined with collections of current invoices, they expect to have enough cash on hand to make the first annual installment to Map Piermont next week. That limits a Mary Moore's investment to the loan of personnel. This was a wonderful find, Darla and, and we've set up paper production as the fourth division of Amerimore because its operation and marketing is so different from the wood products division. Grandma stayed for another 10 minutes while we talked about inspection duties. 
We usually did a final round of inspections just before school started, but this year we'd forego them because of the trip to Vermont. Our last tour had been quite complete and we hadn't uncovered any serious problems at that time. After Grandma left, Susan and I took a walk out to the corral and talked about the trip. We'd have to say goodbye to Gina and Maria a week earlier than expected but at least Susan and I would have these last two weeks together before Judy and I had to leave for Austin. We waited until dinner time to inform the family of our trip. Gina was the first to respond when I broke the news. No way. What's the gag? No, really, Gina, Susan said. Grandma made Darla and the president of the company, and now we have to go up to Vermont again. Both Gina and Maria had already heard the story of how I'd signed an agreement to buy the company before getting permission so with Susan's support of my announcement they began to believe it. That's nice dear, mother said, but I won't have it inferring with your school studies. It won't. Grandma already knows of my commitment to my education. She only wants me to set a course for the company. There will be people there to handle the day-to-day -day operations like her employees do at the other three divisions. How can she expect you to do that? You haven't had any experience with paper manufacturing. I guess that I know as much as anyone else in Amerimore does since it's a new area for us. I really want the factory to succeed. It means a lot to the people of the area because of the scarcity of jobs up there. I started all this so it's only right that I do what I can to support it. But, President? Gina said. I guess that I'm not fit for anything else. Judy and I have to start college in a couple of weeks so I can't take on a real job. This drew a laugh from everybody. I blushed and added, you know what I mean. Maria smiled and said, nothing like starting at the top. Let's celebrate by cutting into one of those new chocolate cakes, Auntie said. For the rest of the night everyone kept referring to me as Madam President. After church the next day Susan and I packed our bags. Fortunately, we had just baked so we had a couple of pies for the pilots. It had become more than just a custom to bring the pilots something and I was glad that we wouldn't be disappointing them on this short notice trip. We said our goodbyes to Gina and Maria as we stood on the ramp in front of the hangar. They would be gone before we returned and we were unsure of when we would see them again. As Gina and I hugged, she whispered in my ear, we'll have to wait for another day, little one. When the plane touched down we said goodbye to Mother, Judy, Mary, and Auntie. Captain O'Toole always liked to be off as quickly as possible so we didn't waste any time once the plane had stopped in front of us. The co-pilot stored our bags in the hold and we boarded the plane after one last goodbye to everybody. And of course we waved as the plane began its takeoff roll. As the plane worked its way northeast, Susan and I discussed the situation in Vermont. Of course neither of us had the foggiest idea of how to run a business. The only thing that we had going for us was the reputation that Grandma had created for me. People would expect that we knew what we were doing and our path should be easier for it. We wouldn't have to spend a lot of time explaining ourselves because, until we messed up, everyone would believe that everything we did had some underlying meaning. As the plane rolled to a stop on the ramp in Vermont, a big black limo pulled up next to the plane, and as we stepped down from the jet we heard, Hello Miss Darla. Hello Miss Susan. I turned, smiled, and said, Hello, Earl. I didn't realize that it would be you meeting us. I thought that you'd be back home. I haven't left the state, Miss Darla. I've been busy driving for the folks coming and going to the new mill and Piermont. As he put our bags into the trunk he said, I've reserved rooms for you at the Holiday Inn again. As we reached the hotel, the bellboy sprinted to open the door on the limo as it rolled to a stop. He managed to get to it before Earl this time. I smiled at him as we exited, and he went to help Earl with the luggage. When we arrived at the front desk to sign in, an older man suddenly appeared from a door behind the counter and gently nudged the desk clerk out of the way. Welcome back to Vermont, Miss Drake. I'm Mr. Cummings, the manager. It's a pleasure to have you with us again. Sign here, please. After we had signed in, Mr. Cummings came around the counter and led the way to our room. As he opened the door and walked in to hold it for us I said, there must be some mistake, Mr. Cummings. We only reserved a double, not a suite. 
No mistake, Miss Drake. The hotel has upgraded your accommodations. We have been very pleased to have the employees of your two companies staying with us and wish to express our appreciation. Thanks to you, this area is expected to begin recovering from the economic slump that we've been suffering from. This room is yours for as long as you're with us and whenever you visit in the future. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. I'm sure that my sister and I will be very happy here. As we spoke, the bellboy carried in a very large fruit basket and a large flower arrangement. While Mr. Cummings reorganized the flowers a little since they had shifted while being carried, I read the card with the fruit basket. Mr. Cummings said, the flowers are courtesy of the hotel. Is there anything else that you will need right now? No, thank you, Mr. Cummings. You've been very kind. Not at all, Miss Drake. Good night. Good night. After they had left, Earl said, What time will you need me in the morning, Miss Darla? 7.30 please, Earl. Okay, Miss Darla. I'll be ready. Susan and I unpacked our suitcases as soon as Earl had gone. It was dinner time so we freshened up and went to the dining room. Tonight's special was main lobster tail. We both chose that and found it delicious. During dinner, Susan said, that's a great-looking fruit basket that the hotel sent up, and the flowers are beautiful. It's nice getting the royal treatment. Yes, it is, but the fruit basket isn't from the hotel. It's from the Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce? How did they know that we were coming? They could have learned from somebody at the plant, or someone in the hotel. Who knows how news spreads? Well, it's a nice basket. I'll send a thank you note tomorrow. After dinner we returned to the suite and watched some television until we grew sleepy, then we turned in. We had two bedrooms, but we preferred to use just one. The switchboard gave us the 6 a.m. wake-up call that I had requested just before going to sleep, and we were ready to leave at 7.30. Earl, always punctual, was waiting at the curb when we emerged from the hotel. The plant was only 15 minutes away and we arrived before the shift was due to start. The first thing that we noticed was that the guard booth was manned. Earl tooted the horn as we approached and the guard actually saluted when we passed. The parking lot was lively with cars and people and was about a quarter filled, which was quite a difference from the last time that we were here. Earl pulled up directly in front of the office building and opened the door for us. Most of the employees were walking towards the plant entrance while Susan and I climbed the steps to the front door of the office building. Stepping into the reception area, we were greeted by Doris. She stood up as we walked in and said, Welcome, Miss Darla. Welcome, Miss Susan. Hello, Doris, I said. Thank you. Susan also acknowledged her greeting. Mr. Fahi will be with you in just a minute, Doris said. He had to run out to the plant. Thank you, Doris. Is Mr. Warren in yet? Yes, ma'am. But Mr. Fahi really wanted to greet you first. He was waiting here, but a call came for him. Very well. We'll wait. Just as I finished speaking, John Fahi came hurrying down a hallway. As soon as he saw us he said, Dee Dee, Miss Susan, welcome. That's all for now, see you in the next video. Please share your valuable opinion and please support me on Patreon to get the early access. Link in the first comment.